Too. We're here to worship the Lord, so let's stand up and do that for a little while.
sovereign God, from the matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing.
this becomes a very cool, very practical and applicational section of scripture. He does this quite a bit. Uh, Paul does. He moves us from belief to behavior. And that's where we're shifting in the next few weeks in this book. Uh, symbolic of that, and I didn't know this until I studied a little bit this week, in chapters 1 through 3, there are zero commands. Zero. <laughs> he just tells us who we are in Christ. What we have in Christ. The blessings we have. We've been grace, we've been peace, and all that. But from chapter 4 to the end of the book, there's almost 40 commands. <coughs> Do this. Do that. Obey. That type of thing. So we're going to be challenged as we move to the tail end of this book, not to just rejoice in who we are, our identity in Christ, and what we have, our blessings in Christ, but we're going to be challenged to put shoe leather to that, to live it out. That's the idea. Ultimately, we are united in Christ to become more and more like Christ. We call that discipleship. Disciple of Jesus. I, I saw this definition this week, and I can't credit it because I don't know who said it first, but it's really spoken to me. A disciple. Someone who has moved from being a recipient of the gospel to being responsible for the gospel. I like that. Someone who has moved from being recipient of the gospel to being responsible for for the gospel. Of course, the ultimate purpose of any church is to make disciples in obedience to Jesus, the great commissioner in Matthew 28, and a couple other places in the Bible. So the plural of disciple is disciples. Who are you discipling? Who are you as a disciple reaching out to and connecting with and encouraging and growing with? The plural of disciple is the disciples. The plural of disciples is church. Church, from the biblical perspective, is supposed to be people called out of the world, called unto God, to become more and more like what he's called them to be. See, tomorrow's church is what you become. Whatever you become in the future will be what this church is in the future. You contain the DNA of the future church. So, if your heart's desire is for the church of the future to be filled with followers of Jesus, what do you need to be? You need to be a follower of Jesus. If your desire for the future of Oak Grove Baptist Church is for people to get saved and come to Christ, what do you need to be doing? You need to be witnessing and telling others about Jesus so others can get saved. If your desire for the church is to be a praying church, what do you need to be doing? You need to be praying, get involved in the prayer ministry. If your desire for the tomorrow church is this church to be compassionate, sensitive to the needs of people, reaching out in the community, what do you need to be doing? Well, you need to be compassionate, obviously. Sensitive, reaching out to the needs of the community. If you want Oak Grove Baptist Church to have marriages that are strong, then what does your marriage need to be? It needs to be strong. If you want a church that has Christ-centered families, what does your family need to be? Well, it needs to be Christ-centered. I could go on and on and on, making an application. But when we read verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3, that's the prayer. That God would be glorified in the church, that the church would be united in purpose of making disciples and growing and developing in the fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Here's the principle I want you to write down. If you haven't written something already, here it's time. In life... You don't get what you want. You get who you are. All of our lives, we're pursuing things. I want this. I want that. I think I want this. I think I need that. And I've talked to many people in 40 years of ministry who got what they want, found out they didn't want it. Wasn't what they thought. You know why? We have not been created to get what we want. God has created us to be who we are. And so he says, your identity is in Christ. That's where you find your true meaning, your true purpose, your north star, your guiding light, if you want to say it that way. So the question is, who are you? 
Chapters 1 through 3, you've answered that question. It tells you who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. Now, chapters 4 through 6 command you to become all that God says you are. So we want to look at that. And the way the Bible, not only in Ephesians, but in many other books, summarizes this, this living out of what Christ is living in is one word, and that word is walk. The Bible calls our experience, our journey, our pilgrimage on this earth as a walk. One foot in front of the other, one day at a time, day after day, walk. So you've got an insert in your bulletin, a little handout that we want to use to guide our conversation this morning. As we start this practical, applicable section of this book, where God is not going to tell us what we have, but he's going to ask us to do something. He's going to command us to become what we believe. He's going to use this walk word seven times in the book of Ephesians. And I call this the seven walks, or as your insert says, walk like an Ephesian. <laughs> I thought about that making the title, but I thought it was a little trendy, so I didn't choose that. And I did put it in the insert because I liked it so much. Thinking about this idea of walking, the Christian life is not this mad dash. God's timing is different than ours. God's schedule is different than ours. God's ways are different than ours. We don't become like the microwave. We don't become like the internet. We don't become quickly. It's a slow process. God is continually working in our lives. So we have to keep walking. We have to keep walking with him together. We have to keep walking as we become. That's the idea. Now, I've alliterated all of these seven walks with the letter W. So if you just want to put W, you'll be ahead. Some people love alliteration. Some people can't stand it. So I realize I've divided the room already. But it helps people remember sometimes. So we're going to begin in chapter 2, verse 2. And this is just a topical message about these seven walks. Like I say, this is the kind of sermon that sort of skips a rock across the pond, and maybe you'll get a little wet in a couple of places. Maybe you'll get a little on you. But seven times in this book, Paul uses the word walk or the concept. I think there's one time of these six in some of the newer versions he doesn't use the word walk. I'll point that out when we get to it. So chapter 2, verse 2, we're going to call it the wrathful walk. Or you could call it the wicked walk. Not a good thing. He says in chapter 2, verse 2, there was a time when you walked. There it is. Like the world walked. Like the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan, the devil. That's old smutty face. That's old red legs. He's got a way of tempting and leading and making us go a certain direction. And before we know Jesus, he just manipulates us. We're just like puppets on his string. We don't have any power to do what we want to do to follow God. He says, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, and keep on reading down the end of verse 3, he says, you were by nature the children of wrath. There it is. The wrathful walk. The wicked walk. The Bible tells us something that makes us very uncomfortable. No matter how we try to push it down and, and tuck it away, the Bible says we're sinners. We've sinned. We've sinned. We've sinned. And we're separated from God. So he actually says in verse 1 of chapter 2, you're dead in trespasses and sins. That's our original condition. That's our nature. That's the way it is. And so we walk like that. We're born like that. Now, at some point in our walking experience, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, a sermon, a witness encounter with somebody, uh, something happens where God begins to tell us about our guilt. He tells us in our conscience. He tells us through creation. He tells us through Christ. He has many ways to tell us that we need to repent. We need to come to him, that he will save us if we come. But boy, I tell you what, some people have a hard time coming. They like their sin. They like their lifestyle. They like it like it is. They begin to say, well, I'm better than so-and-so, or I'm not as bad as such-and-such. -such. They come with all kinds of ways to legitimize their lifestyle when God says, it's killing you. I love you. It's destroying you. My way's best for you. 
But you can't have it both ways. Remember, Jesus said you can't have two masters. It doesn't work like that. But that's our walk. Now, people who are in the wrathful walk or the wicked walk, the unsaved walk, the, the worldly walk, you can call it even. There's another W. <laughs> people who are in that particular pattern, the Bible says they're trapped. They're hostage in their own life incapable of changing it no matter how many good things they do and many people who don't know God personally do many many good things but those good things don't amount to anything compared to what Jesus did on the cross and so until we repent of sin and say I'm walking the wrong way I'm walking straight to hell I need to do a U-turn I need to repent I need to change my mind and agree with God Confess my sin and trust Jesus as the Savior. That's the wrathful walk. Now he says to these Ephesians, you should be like that. If you go back and read Acts chapter 19, write it down, read it later. That's where Paul went to Ephesus. And that's where he preached the gospel. And there was a lot of idolatry in Ephesus, so much that uh, when the gospel made inroads into Ephesus, the people that made the idols got all upset because business went way down. Because people who used to buy those idols and worship those idols threw them away. In fact, it says there in Acts 19, 19, I believe, check me out, that they had a big burn party. <laughs> they brought all their curious arts and images and books. And they heaped them up in about 50,000 pieces of silver work. They just threw them in the fire. Why? No more walking the wrathful way, the wicked way, the worldly way. But that's where we all start. And if you keep walking that way, there's only one place for you. Separated from God. You have to walk over the dead and risen body of Jesus to get there, but you'll get there if you keep walking that way. But God doesn't want that for you and I. So turn on over to the next walk. I said I was going to spend three minutes on each one of these, but tighten it up, preacher. Tighten it up. <laughs> Ephesians 2 8, 9, 10. We know these verses. By grace, you're saved through faith. Stop walking that wrathful way, that wicked way, that worldly way. You stop letting the devil tell you what to do, who you are. I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. You turn to Jesus and you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. <laughs> it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then verse 10. Here it is, the second one. We are his workmanship. Remember, that's the word for poem in the Greek, which means masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. Anybody that stops walking the wicked way and turns to God and goes his way, you become a trophy of God's grace. You become evidence that the devil's a loser. And that Jesus is the winner. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, if you have a new version, it will say something like, which God prepared for us to do, or ordained for us to do. But it's the same word there in the original Greek. It's the word walk. That's what I call number two, the welcome walk. We turn around and go to God's way, and God says, welcome. 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 Isn't it awesome that God would love sinners like us so much that he would just throw his arms open and say, come on. Come on. Come on. Not come on, but first, I would love to have you in my family, but let's talk about, no. When we make up our mind and it gets down into our heart to turn from the wicked way, to turn from the wrathful wolf, God is standing there like the prodigal son's father in Luke 15 with both arms wide open to welcome us into his family. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And there may be some people here this morning that need to turn around and trust God. Need to come to Jesus today. You may know about Jesus up here. You may have been baptized, sprinkled as a baby, confirmed somewhere, going through some religious instruction. But it's never got to your heart where you felt the welcoming, wonderful love of God. But that's where it begins. 8, 9, and 10. Once you come to Jesus, you're welcomed in, and then you begin walking with him and with others. That's the welcome walk. That's what we call being born again. It's being converted. 
Being saved. Getting saved, as the old preachers used to say down south. And that's a wonderful day. For me, I've given my testimony many times. I was a good boy, but I wasn't God's boy. I've been to Buckley Church, and Oak Grove Church, and this church, and that church, and the other church. It didn't help me at all. <laughs> I was in the youth group and the RAs, and no, not the GAs, that was the girls, the RAs and, and all that stuff. I did all that stuff. And I enjoyed it. I love to hear mission stories and, and, and be involved with my friends, but I wasn't born again until July the 12th, 1981, right here in this church, right here in this building. As a young guy, I came to Christ. It changed my life, changed my eternity, changed my everything. Didn't know I was going to be a preacher. Didn't know I was going to come back and preach at the church I used to be a member of. Had no clue. That's God's business. That's part of verse 10, his workmanship. He's working on you. He's working on me. But it all begins when we start that welcome walk. When we start, stop walking towards hell and we start walking towards heaven. Chapter 4. This is our passage this morning. I just want to read verses 1 through 3 to set up even next week. Chapter 4, Paul says, I therefore, <coughs> excuse me, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. Number 3, the worthy walk. That you walk worthy of the vocation, not vacation, the vocation, that doesn't mean your job. Vocadio, the Greek word means calling. That you would walk worthy of your calling. God is calling on your life calling on my life, calling on our church, a calling for us, a purpose, a plan, a future. So he says, I challenge you to walk this worthy walk with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The whole theme of Ephesians, we're united in Christ. It should be all of our desire to walk in such a way where we stay unified, we stay connected, we our purpose, on plan, on point with what God is calling us to do. That should be all of our desires. That should be job one. So the worthy walk involves not only my personal walk with God, but it involves my walk with brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only in this church, but in every church, but specifically in my own church family, whatever I call my church home. I want to be praying for them. I want to be involved with them. I want to be engaged. I want to get to know them. I want to be more than a church attender. I want to be more than a church member. I want to be part of the body of Christ, serving him and glorifying him. That ought to be everybody's desire to walk like that. That's the worthy walk. Why? Well, none of us is worthy. <laughs> but as we walk this worthy walk, we're saying that Jesus is worthy. He's worthy. He died on the cross. He stopped my slide into hell. He welcomed me into heaven. And because of that, I want to walk for him. I want to walk in a way that's going to bring worth to his name and draw people to him. That ought to be my desire. And if there's anything that gets in the way of that, I need to deal with that. He shows me. The worthy walk. We're not trying to make ourselves worthy. We're worthy in him. He just told us that in chapters 1 through 3. Now he's saying that that's true about you. If you are a believer, if you are in Christ, then walk in such a way as to where it demonstrates it. And he gives you some character qualities there, patience and, and humbleness and, and love. He'll talk about those things more as we get later on in this chapter. That's the worthy walk. Now, as we walk for Christ in this world, we get hurt. Our hearts get broken. Things happen. Absolutely. Uh, all of a sudden, you're a target for the devil. You know, he had you before, but now he's lost you. He's not happy about that. So he'll try to drive wedges between people. He'll try to bust up marriages. He'll try to uh, bankrupt people's testimonies by having them make a stupid decision that destroys everything good that they ever did. And you got to watch out for that. But the best way to watch out for that is to walk worthy. Just wake up every day and say, Lord, here I am. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me. Guide me that I may glorify you. Pray a little simple prayer like that. I guarantee you he'll do it every time. But if you don't have the desire, if you just get up and drift through the day, oh, well, there's lots of temptations. There's lots of troubles. There's lots of opportunities to get off track. 
And walking means putting one foot in front of the other as we listen to the voice of Jesus who said what? Follow me. A worthy walk. Maybe you got off track. We'll get to that in just a minute. Maybe you need to get back on. Verse 17, moving right along. Paul says, this I say, therefore, there's another therefore, testify in the Lord that you from this point on walk not. There it is. As other Gentiles walk, there is yet in the vanity of their mind. This is what I call the wayward walk. Sometimes a person will come to Christ, they'll walk good for a while, but then they'll uh, get kind of crooked in their walk. They'll kind of drift. They'll sort of say, I know Jesus saved me, and I know I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing, but, and I don't want to make anybody too uncomfortable, but a lot of times I get in people's homes or involved in people's lives, and we talk about certain things that they struggle with, certain things that make them stumble, but they don't do anything about it. Preacher will talk to them, preacher will counsel them, show them some scripture, give them a book to read, pray with them, but they don't change their lifestyle. They don't take God seriously. They continue to sin, and they wonder why they get farther and farther away. Then, you can't get them to come back to church. They're not interested. They got other things to do. And then one day the preacher will be distant just because he loves them and he cares. And they'll say something like this with a sneer that looks like it came straight out of hell. Who are you to judge, preacher? Six months earlier we was walking together, singing in the choir, hand in hand, trusting Jesus. Now they don't even look like a Christian. Well, what is, that's the way we walk, you see. That's what he's talking about. Notice verse 17, 18, 19. Read that. It sounds just like an unbeliever. The vanity of their mind, their understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God, blindness of their heart, past feeling, lasciviousness. That's sexual sin, specifically. I don't know why Christians think they can live together, not being married, but they do. I thought I could real quiet at this point. I, I don't know why we take the standards of the world and think God's going to continue to bless us. We've got to repent of that stuff and stop walking in a wayward way and get back on track walking the worthy way. That's the wayward walk. And what happens many times in a person's life, if you look at your life, Christian life specifically, like a timeline in a history book, you'll see gaps. It's close to God here, then this happened, and I was, and I came back, and then this, that's the wayward walk. Every time you fall off the wagon with God, you're in the wayward walk. You're in the ditch. You ignored God's guardrails. You got off the road. You got in the ditch. But, you can come back. If that's you today, if you're not where you need to be with Jesus, Jesus says, come on back. But you'll have to change some things. You'll have to do some things. You'll have to adjust to him. And that's the best thing in the world you could ever do. Chapter 5, verse 2. Let's move on. Move on, preacher. We're tired of that. <laughs> this is what I call the wonderful walk. Notice what he says. Be there, there's another therefore. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as. Now, he didn't let you define love. He doesn't let me define love. He doesn't let us define love. He defines love. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. I uh, say, I was reading this this morning in my daily Bible reading. Got reading guides out there if you'd like to get one. Uh, Leviticus chapter 6, 7, and 8. I was reading that this morning. I've already read through Genesis, Exodus, Mark, and Acts, and a few Psalms and Proverbs. And it's in the book of Leviticus now, and probably a half a dozen times that, that last statement there in verse 2 
was there in the book of Leviticus chapter 6, 7, and sweet smelling Savior. As they, they brought their offerings and they obeyed God, it went up to God as a beautiful aroma. That's what he's talking about. As we walk the wonderful walk, the walk of love. I told you last week, C.S. Lewis said, love is never wasted because its value is not based on reciprocity. If you love somebody and they don't love you back, you still benefit from it. And if you love somebody and they love you back, you both benefit from it. You can't go wrong with love. Paul said, love is the greatest thing in the world. Now by these three, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. A wonderful walk. Just to love people. Just to believe in them. Just to accept them. It doesn't mean you agree with everything they do. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. But it means that you appreciate them and you believe for them what God appreciates about them and believes for them. It's a wonderful walk. Let me tell you something else. After 40 years of ministry, it sleeps good at night. Just to love people. And do the best you can. To help them along the way. It's the only way to live as far as I'm concerned. Even if you couldn't go to heaven, it'd be the only way to live. But after you live it, you go to heaven too. <laughs> it's a wonderful walk. Walk in love like Jesus loved us. So, let him love you, and you just love other people out of that. That's it. John 13, 34, 35. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. It's a wonderful walk, a walk of love. And then verse 8. This is our memory verse for the week. You were sometimes darkness. That was back in that little wicked, wrathful walk. But now you're light. In the Lord, walk as children of light. I call this the witnessing walk. You and I, who know God, are to live in such a way as the people would know that we know God. And witnessing is both a life and a lip. It's both a walk and a word. We have a platform, a life that we live, but at some point both we have to be able to express that, to share with people, to tell them about Jesus, to perhaps answer some of their questions and work through some of the issues because, as you know, the world is very antagonistic towards Christianity at this time. And it's easy for us to sort of pull back and think everybody's against us, you know. But this is the time, verse 8, when darkness is increasing, that light must shine. Light must always shine. So as you walk as children of light, salt and light, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, but you are engaging the darkness each day with your walk. And then, of course, there's your talk. <laughs> You're the old, the old expression, he can talk the talk, but he can't walk the walk. You've heard that expression, I guess. And so we've got to be able to walk the walk for anybody to hear the talk that we talk. So this is the witnessing walk, walking in the light, walking as children of light, having different standards, different convictions, and not in a judgmental or a hypocritical or condemnatory way, but in real, genuine sincerity and truth, wanting to live out this thing that God calls eternal life in such a way as to where people become interested in. And they want to know more about it. And they want to be engaged with it. The witnessing walk. Almost call it the wild walk. <laughs> because when people do it, it's wild. Like I said, whatever you want the future of this church to be, it'll be you. Whatever you become, this will be what it is. And you don't get what you want, you don't get who you are. So if we would get really serious about this witnessing walk, it'd be wild. Be fantastic. It'd be incredible. That's the witnessing walk. Maybe you need to be doing that. Maybe you need to be more engaged. You're a wonderful person in your walk, you love, but you're not really witnessing. You're not sharing. You're not looking for those opportunities. Back in chapter one, at the end of the chapter, we prayed, Open the eyes of my heart. Some of you may have been here that day. The group did the song at the end, Open the Eyes of My Heart. We said, let's be unified that God will begin to open our eyes and let us see the opportunities that are around us, places we need to go, the people we need to see, what we need to do. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, from the witnessing 
walk. And then verse 15, and I'm done. We call it the wise walk or the wisdom walk. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly. And that's an old King James word for walking in a way where you see everything around you. You consider all that's there. Wisdom. I, I mean, I'm, I'm pushing hard for us to get out of the pew and get out to where people are. I'm pushing hard for us to be a, a church on mission. But there's a walk to it. There's a pace to it. There's a rhythm to it. The urgency of lost people and broken people and what's going on all around us is there. But God still says, I want you to go my pace, my plan, my purpose. Don't just run roughshod off trying to do something. Because there's going to be a wisdom to it. We can't save everybody. We can't meet everybody's needs. We can't do it all. We can't do what we can do as a church, as a fellowship. So he says, walk circumspectly. Circumspectly, not as fools, random, but as wise, redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Yes, they are. Wherefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Wisdom walk. So we've been working through refocus, the refocus process. We're working on disciples' pathway right now. How do we take a person who's a first-time visitor to this church and help them become a fully devoted disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ? What does this church need to do to help anybody, present or future, to follow Jesus in their walk? been talking about that. And it takes a lot of wisdom to know what to do and what not to do. And I appreciate the progress we've made on that. I think that's going to be wonderfully used in the future by this church to help people with their walk. Wisdom. The wisdom walk. Alright, there they are. The wrathful walk, the welcome walk, the worthy walk, the wayward walk, the wonderful walk, the witnessing walk, and the wisdom walk. So how's your walk? How are you walking with God? As the group comes, we have this final song. You may want to come to this altar and pray. You may need to uh, talk to me. I'll be up here if you'd like to talk about something, talk about something. Maybe you need to accept Christ as your Savior. Begin your walk with God. Maybe you need to get back on track. Maybe you want to get involved in a deeper walk with God. Bible study, prayer group. Maybe you're involved in ministry. You want to start walking down that path. Anything God is doing in your life. This is the time that we respond. Father, we thank you so much for making it possible for us to walk your way. And it is your way. Your way is the highway. <laughs> and help us, Lord, get in step with you. Follow you, as Jesus said. Follow me. And help each one of us to look at our own hearts and lives and see whatever disturbances and distractions there might be, any kind of alterations or adjustments we might need to make. Help each one of us, Lord, to have a deep desire to walk worthy of the calling for which you call us. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. This is our hymn of decision, our hymn of commitment, our hymn of confession, our hymn of prayer. You know. I
here behind you all. 